Rome. A word that can strike up many ideas, emotions and discussions. What does Rome mean? What does it mean to be Roman? And why does it seem like the Romans, hundreds of years after their apparent collapse, still fascinate people in such great magnitude? The Roman Republican Empire still holds great importance to this very day. The decisions and their consequences that these people made during ancient times are still being felt in our modern society, especially in the West. Rome as a political and national entity on the world's map might be gone, but the idea and meaning behind the Roman state survived throughout the years. But to understand the Romans, why and how they achieved so much, we must go back to the beginning. We must delve into just as much myth as history and see how a small group of people through hard work, luck and sheer will managed to build the most influential nation in human history. No direct sources survives of Rome's early history. Most of what historians know and discuss today is information taken from much later sources. The Romans themselves often had a hard time describing early Roman history, which leaves us with many varying accounts from intellectuals with different opinions and spins on the story. Even though early Roman history is wrapped up in myth and legend, it's still important for us as modern historians to learn and discuss this time period. Doing this will teach us about how the Romans saw themselves or how they wanted other people to see them. Through these myths we get a glimpse of the Roman people's beliefs and what was important in a society for themselves. Rome's founding legend takes us back to the eve of the Trojan War. Troy had been sacked by the Greeks, so a hero named Aenus fled the destruction with a collection of followers. By ship they sailed the Mediterranean to find a new place to call home. From Troy, which was located in Asia Minor, they sailed to Carthage in northern Africa, modern-day Tunisia. While in Carthage, Aena seduced a Carthaginian queen named Dido, but he would later abandon her in his quest to find a new home for his people. Dido, being distraught by this act, would curse both Aena and her own people to eternal enmity and afterwards take her own life by throwing herself into a burning pyre. Aena and his people would continue on their journey and sail towards the west coast of Italy. Here, in the territory of Laurentum, central Italy, he and his followers hoped to start a settlement. This area where the Trojans had landed was inhabited by the Latins. The Latin king Latinus did not wish for conflict with the Trojans and so he offered his daughter Lavinia's hand in marriage to Aeneas. Turnus, prince of a nearby tribe called the Rutuli, was angered by this decision for he had himself been promised Lavinia's hand in marriage. The Rutuli declared war on the Trojan Latin alliance but would be defeated. In the conflict, the Latin king Latinus would be killed, leaving Aenas as the sole ruler of the Trojans and Latins who would start intermarrying into a single people. Turnus and the Rutuli, being defeated but not completely destroyed, would seek help from the Etruscans, a people living to the north of the Latins. The Etruscans had been eyeing the Trojan-Latin alliance as a growing threat and decided to attack. Aenas would in his final act defeat the Etruscans and establish the Tiber River as the boundary between their respective peoples. The story of Aenas is an important and different one from many other founding legends. For starters, whereas many origin stories have their people as the indigenous of the land, the Roman one have them as foreigners, even refugees. This could point to the later Roman expansion and how more and more people became incorporated and assimilated into being Roman. Being Roman was therefore not connected to the land, but instead the idea and culture of Rome. The origin story also has a part which establishes the hatred and animosity between the Carthaginians and the Romans, probably the most iconic rivalry of ancient Rome. If the rivalry between these two people got its start in the founding legend, it shows how important it was for the development of the Roman Republic. Even though Aenas did not found the city of Rome, he is a vital part of the story and it gave the Romans a claim to a Greek heritage. Aenas, because of his actions, became the founder of a Trojan Latin territory, later known as Lavinium. This alliance and the mixing of the people would create a Roman identity we later see. According to the story, Aenas's son, Ascanius, would found the city of Alba Longa, which would be a vital part in the continuation of the myth. After Aenas dies, his son Ascanius becomes king of Lavinium. It is not completely clear if Ascanius had been born in Troy and followed Aenas on his journey to central Italy, or if he was born at a later date in Lavinium. During the Interregnum, an Etruscan king named Mesentius decides to besiege the city and even succeeds in making it surrender. 
but upon his retirement back to Etruscan lands, Ascanius attacks his host with an army of his own. The whole ordeal ends with Mesentius' son being killed in the battle, and the Etruscans being forced to pay tribute. Ascanius would, thirty years after his father founded Lavinium, found his own city called Alba Longa and become its first king. Many kings would rule Alba Longa, and it is not this project's intention to cover them all fully, but I will grow, go through them in small detail to give you an understanding of the city's history up until Romulus founded Rome. Silvius would take reign after Ascanius, his brother. It is said that when Silvius was born, his mother Lavinia hid him in the forest, for she believed that Ascanius would kill his brother as he was a threat to his power. Silvius was thereafter named after his birthplace, Silvia, meaning forest. When Silvius became king himself, he had to deal with Ascanius' son in a power dispute, which he won. Silvius was followed by Aeneas Silvius, his own son, who is said to be the founder of the Silvi house, and he was himself followed by Latinus Silvius, who according to Titus Livius, Roman historian, founded the majority of settlements in Latium at the time. After the death of Latinus, Alba Silvius would take the throne. According to the pseudo-historical work Historia Regum Britanniae, written by a British cleric, the ancient British king Ebracus would send many of his daughters to Alba Silvius to intermarry into the Trojan Latin nobility. This information was added in later British tradition, but we here see a clear example of other cultures' own myths and legends intermixing with the Roman one for legitimacy. The sixth king of Alba Longa would be Atis, who according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, the cleric I mentioned earlier, would succeed to kingship at the time when Solomon began to build his temple in Jerusalem. Atus would be succeeded by Capis, who we have almost no information on. Same goes for the following king, Capetus. Capetus' son, Tiberinus, would succeed him as king, but he would have a tragic end to his reign according to the legends. Tiberinus would drown in the river then known as Albula, but would afterwards be renamed to the Tiber. After his death, Tiberinus would be revered as the god of the river. He would have his own cult in the early days of Rome. After his drowning, Agrippa would take his place as king, according to some made up by the Emperor Augustus to give prestige to his son-in-law Agrippa. Romulus Silvius became king next and is said to have been a wicked ruler who pretended to conjure thunderstorm to frighten his subjects. Ironically enough, it is also said that he perished in the same kind of storm. Romulus Silvius would be succeeded by Aventinus, who is said to have had the Aventine Hill named after him, after he was buried there. It is also stated that the same hill is named after birds, aves, which would nest there, but such is the nature of myth and legends. Procas would be proclaimed king after Aventinus, who is mostly known for being the father of his more important son, Amulius and Numitor, who both in their own terms would become king after him. These mythical kings of Alba Longa are most likely made up after and to fill gaps in history, but more importantly to explain things the Roman or later people could not explain themselves. The king Tiberinus probably got his name after the river Tiber, when he was made up and not the other way around, just as Augustus would later create the king Agrippa to give legitimacy and prestige to his friend and son-in-law by the same name. This uncertainty of events and people will continue to plague early Roman history because of the simple fact we do not have enough sources on the matter. These mythical kings gives us an insight on how the Romans themselves tried to explain their early history, how towns and landmarks had gotten their names, and how by this long line of kings they could still trace their lineage back to ancient Greece, with all of what that entails. We have now arrived at the most crucial parts of Rome's founding myth the lives of the twins Romulus and Remus. The brothers would be born in Alba Longa, not long before their birth. Numitor, king of the city, had been overthrown by his brother Amulius. Amulius, who wanted to secure his place of power, exiled Numitor and forbade his daughter, Rhea Silvia, to bear any children by forcing her to become a Vestal virgin. The story goes that Rhea Silvia would be visited by the god Mars in a grove dedicated to him, where they would conceive the twins. Amulius naturally saw these newly born children as a threat to his rule and ordered them to be killed. He also threw Rhea Silvia into prison for good measure. The men who were given the task of murder took them to the river Tiber to drown the infants, but when they arrived the river had flooded the banks. 
the men, whether seeing it too much a hassle to wade out into the deeper parts, or perhaps getting a conscience, abandoned the children at the riverbanks instead of committing the deed of murder. In the most famous part of the story, the twins would be found by a she-wolf, which would nurture them by offering her teats. Here, Livy, a Roman historian, comments that the word for she-wolf, lupa in Latin, is the same as the word for prostitute. Livy argues that maybe it was not a literal wolf who saved the twins, but instead a prostitute, maybe even the wife of the next character in the story I am about to introduce. She-wolf or prostitute, the boys would nonetheless survive and later be found by a herdsman, who would take the twins under his own care. Faustulus was his name. Over the years the boys would grow into men and become natural leaders who would gain the support of the local community by fighting brigands and bandits alike. On one such occasion, Remus would be captured and brought to the local chief who was none other than the exiled king Numitor. Numitor, after listening to Remus and reminding himself that his daughter's children would be the same age, suspected this to be his long-lost grandchildren. After reuniting with their grandfather, the twins would learn of the past and they would join forces with Numitor to reinstate him as king of Alba Longa. Amulius would be killed in the following conflict and after regaining the kinship for their grandfather, Romulus and Remus would set out to found their own city. It is not known how the twins decided upon the seven hills for their city. Cicero, a later famous Roman statesman, writes that the hills made for good defense against the surrounding enemies, while the Tiber River made for easy trade. Other legend legends would just explain the location by saying that it was the same place where the twins had been abandoned as infants. The twins might have been in agreement on the hilly area, but they certainly did not agree on which hill to found the city on. Romulus would prefer the Palatine Hill, while Remus argued for the Aventine. Not being able to solve their disagreements themselves, the twins would let the gods decide. Remus would not long after have six bird land on his hill, but soon Romulus had twelve bird land on his own one. Remus claimed victory by the primacy of arrival, while Romulus did the same but with the number of birds. A fight would ensue during their argument, where Remus would be killed either by his own brother or by one of his followers. Another story goes that after picking their separate hills, Remus would jump over Romulus' non-completed walls. This act would anger Romulus so much that he would kill his brother and afterwards exclaim, So perish whoever should overleap my battlements. Whichever story one subscribes to, at the end of the day Remus was killed and Romulus would be the one to decide where the city would be founded. The date of the city's birth would be the 21st of April, 753 BCE. The myth of Rome's founding is a peculiar one. The fact that it includes fratricide, where Romulus kills his brother, may seem strange to an outsider, but probably not so much to the Romans themselves. During the centuries after Rome's founding, the Republic and later Empire would go through numerous civil wars. Maybe the inclusion of the struggle between the twins was a self-reflection of the later Romans that fighting between themselves was not something weird, but instead a part of their very history and culture. The death of Remus will not be the last unorthodox situation early Rome would find itself in, as you will soon see. But before we continue our story, we must go through the area surrounding Rome, to paint a clearer picture of Romulus's continued reign as king. Ancient Italy, before the Roman conquests, is hard to map down, precisely because of Jostos' conquests the Romans carried out. After Rome had expanded and established itself, it brought its civilization and later its riches to the surrounding areas, especially in the rest of Italy, where new Roman cities prompted up old ones from previous civilizations were either destroyed or in many cases built over in the span of many generations. Modern archaeologists do sometimes find pre-Roman sites like Etruscan graveyards or Greek colonies, but it is just often fractions of what they once were. Written sources or legends from these civilizations are almost non-existent, except ones written by the Romans themselves, which often paint their enemies in a darker picture than what they would have thought of themselves. But from adding together both archaeological finds, old legends and Roman sources, we can get a somewhat realistic picture of what the Italian peninsula would have looked like around 800 BCE. In Aeneas' legends, it is stated that after winning his conflict against the Etruscans, he established the Tiber as the border between the two peoples. Even if it, his legend is most likely fake, this geographic border is somewhat correct. 
The Etruscans, or Etruria as it is sometimes called, were not a single kingdom, but instead a collection of villages and tribes which shared a culture and language. It is now widely accepted that the Etruscans spoke a non-Indo-European language, which could point to them having been one of the indigenous peoples of Italy. Even if they had a different language, it does seem like the Etruscan had a similar religion to the Greeks and later Romans. It seems likely that Greek traders most probably introducing their pantheon among the Etruscan people. It also seems like the Etruscans integrated a lot of the political ideas of Magna Graecia to the south, but still keeping it more aristocratic in line with their own system of governance. The Etruscans managed to expand all over the Apennine mountain ranges and became a strong regional power. The villages seemed to have enriched themselves in the mining and trade of metals such as copper and iron. Thanks to these natural resources, they managed to expand their influence across the Italian peninsula and the western Mediterranean, where they sometimes came into contact with the Carthaginian Empire. In southern Italy, there existed many Greek colonies. These colonies were not of the modern sense, but instead Greek people or traders who had either fled or set out to start a new life away from Greece. These city-states were not controlled by old Greek kingdoms, and their only connection to them was their shared history culture and people. The collection of these colonies in southern Italy is called Magna Graecia or Great Greece. It seems that most of the colonies sprang up sometime around the 800 to 600 BCE, which fits with Aeneas' mythical flight from Troy. Thanks to the Greek colonists and traders, their religion, culture and language were transported across all the Mediterranean, but especially in Italy. Both the Romans and the Etruscans would adopt some form of the Greek religion, but equally importantly, their alphabet. The Greeks were seen as an important and powerful political player in ancient Italy, and not many dared to anger them because of the risk of actual Greece and their powerful cities becoming involved. The central part of Italy, surrounding the city of Rome itself, was inhabited by many different tribes of people. It does seem like almost all of these tribes shared an Indo-European heritage, which means none of them were indigenous like the Etruscans. Just south of Rome many Latin communities had sprung up, and next to them you had people like the Samnites, who lived in the mountains of central Italy. Northeast of Rome, the area was inhabited by the Veneti and Sabines, which will be important in the continuing story of Romulus. Although these are not all of the different cultures in Italy, they are some of the most important to recognize now. More will be covered as we follow in the Roman expansion south and north. Romulus did have a following of close compatriots, as is described earlier in his myth, but they were not numerous enough to populate his new city. To grow his new city fast, Romulus decided to open up the place to people of all backgrounds and professions. He declared Rome to be an asylum for peoples of no other home. The consequences of this decision were instantly noticed. Yes, the city had grown, but almost by only by criminals, fugitives and escaped slaves, who almost all were men. Romulus did not however care about the background of his new population, and immediately began constructing the first Roman army. The first order of business was to divide the population into able-bodied men who could be of use in the new Roman legion, and the rest of society. It is believed that the first legion consisted of 3,000 foot soldiers and 300 cavalry, but if this is the case, there can't have been more than just one single legion in this early development of the city. There simply would not have been enough men to fill the ranks of numerous of these legion constellations. The soldiers had to equip themselves, which led to only the richest among the Romans could afford to participate in the army, especially the cavalry. What this led to was an army of Romans who protected the interests of the people of Rome, even if it was mostly only the middle and upper class of society. Of the people that were important but not fit enough to fight in the army, Romulus created the Senate. The first Senate is said to have included 100 senators filled with men of important standing in the new Roman society. The Senate in these early years would help Romulus govern in both peace and war. The persons in the Senate would later evolve into the Roman patrician class, while many of those outside it would become the plebeian counterpart. Romulus had created a city and filled it with people. He had created an army to defend the borders of his new city, and a Senate to help him govern, but the future of Rome looked bleak. 
As mentioned before, almost only men had come to the city seeking asylum, and when Romulus sent envoys to the surrounding city-states of the Sabines and Latins for marriage, con marriage contracts, all were refused. As it currently stood, no one wanted to marry their daughters to the dregs of Rome. Romulus had to solve the problem, otherwise the city would die after only one generation. The solution that he decided on was a straightforward one. If the Romans could not legally get wives, they would kidnap them. The Romans with Romulus at their head hatched a plan where they would take the women of the nearby Latin and Sabine communities. They invited the populations of these towns to a festival of games in Neptune's honor. Wanting to see the new Roman city and indulge in the games, many families went to Rome to participate. While the festival was in full swing, Romulus gave the command and the Romans started to grab the Latin and Sabine women while fighting off the males who tried to protect them. The Sabines and Latins, completely surprised, had to abandon their daughters and flee back to their respective communities. Trying to calm the frightened kidnapped woman, Romulus told them that their fathers should not have been so picky when the Romans first asked for marriage contracts, and that they would be treated fairly and well by their new husbands because of the guilt they now felt after committing this scandalous act. Outraged at the Roman kidnappings, the king of the Caninenses, a Latin community, invaded Roman territory with his army. Romulus would meet him in battle, where his new legion would be tested for the first time. The Romans defeated the Caninenses and killed their king in battle. Romulus later led his army to Canina, their enemy city, and conquered it after a single assault. After returning to Rome, Romulus would build a temple to Jupiter, the first temple in Rome, and offer the god the spoils taken from the Caninenses. Romulus would also establish one of Rome's most important traditions by holding its first triumph, a celebratory festival for defeating Rome's enemies. At the same time as the Romans had been fighting the Caninenses, another Latin community called the Antemnates had invaded Rome's boundaries. Romulus and his legion retaliated and defeated this new threat in battle, and afterward captured their hometown of Antemnae. Romulus would hold his second triumph after this new victory. Lastly, the Latin community of the Crustumini would also declare war, but they too would be defeated by the arms of Rome. After defeating the Latins, Romulus would send out Roman colonists to their newly conquered towns, but also let their former enemies migrate into Rome, boosting its populations. The troubles of war were far from over though, even with the defeat of the Latins. The Sabines, led by their king Titus Tatius, would finally declare war upon the Romans. The story goes that the Sabine armies almost captured Rome when the daughter of the Roman governor of the Capitoline Hill citadel opened the gates for the invading armies. She had been promised what the Sabine soldiers bore on their arms. Believing this to be their golden bracelets, she betrayed her people. The Sabines, instead of giving her their bracelets, would crush her to death with their shields. She would be buried by a rock that would later be named the Tarpian Rock, after her own name. The Romans would attack the citadel now held by the Sabines, which would be the beginning of the battle of the Lacus Curtius. The Roman legion was led by Hostus Hostilius, but he would fall in the fighting and the Roman line would start to falter. The Romans would retreat to the Palatinum Gate, where Romulus would come and rally his men by promising them to build a temple to Jove, the god of sky and thunder. Romulus would then lead the Romans back into battle. Not long after, the Sabine commander would fall off his horse and flee from the battlefield. It now looked like the Romans would win the day. The kidnapped Sabine woman, who looked with horror as their new husbands and their fathers fought and killed each other, would at this point famously intervene. Not wanting to lose either their old or new families, they ran into the fray and stopped the fighting. It were better that we perish than live widowed or fatherless with one, without one or the other of you, the Sabine women would exclaim. Their battle would come to an end and it would be decided that the Roman and Sabines would unite into a single people, jointly ruled by Romulus and Titus Tatius. The new Sabine residents would settle themselves on the Capitoline Hill, which they had captured in the battle. After peace had been struck and the power sharing agreement had been decided upon, the two kings of Rome decided to divide the city into three tribes, 
one of Romans, the second of Sabines, and lastly the third, which consisted of a mixture of people such as Etruscans and Latins. 100 Sabines were also added to the Senate to give their people a better representation in the governing of the city. Romulus also decided to increase the size of the Roman legion to 6,000 men, a number which would stand for a long time. The power sharing between Titus and Romulus would not hold for long though, as after only five years the Sabine king would be killed by an angry mob in Lavinium after having assaulted some of their envoys. Romulus was once again the sole ruler of the Roman kingdom. After Titus' death, he decided not to avenge the murder because he did not wish for another war with the Latins, and he most likely felt relieved not having to share power anymore. The Sabine population of Rome became outraged at the lack of response to the killing of their king, but it is said that Romulus's power over his subject and his apparent divine aura stopped them from revolting. During the following years, Romulus would keep ruling the growing city until the Fidenates, an Etruscan tribe, decided to invade Rome's territories to stop what he saw as a growing threat to Etruscan influence in the region. Romulus would set an ambush close to the city of Fidenae and trick the garrison force to sally from the city. The Roman army would rush down the city's defenders and enter the city which led to the enemy surrender. It is believed that Fidenae would become a Roman colony after this conquest. The Veientes, another Etruscan tribe from the city of Vei, looked upon the Roman conquest of Fidenae with concern and so would launch an incursion into Roman territory. Romulus and his men would meet the Veientes in battle outside of Vei city walls, where they would be victorious once again. The city's population and the retreating army would garrison themselves inside the city, and the Romans did not have the strength to take it by force and instead laid waste to the surrounding area. Seeing their hopeless situation, the Veientes would ask for peace and would subsequently cede parts of their territory to the Roman kingdom. Romulus would rule for 37 years. One day, while reviewing his truce, it is said that he was embellished in a cloud and taken up to the gods. It is entirely possible that he was murdered by the Senate, as some sources try to explain. Romulus was apparently more popular with the people than with the patrician class. Romulus's story and his kingship might be completely fabricated, or may be inspired by a real person of history, but embellished to look grander. The sources are simply too few to truly know how and what happened this early in Roman history. Even if Romulus's character is made up, he gave the Romans themselves important answers that they otherwise never could have answered. Romulus is credited with the founding of the city, creating its legion and senate, holding the first triumph and many other things important for Roman culture. His character has become the starting point in many Roman traditions that would over the centuries develop into grander and more important institutions, and that is why it is so important to learn and understand his story. Even though Aenas and Romulus' respective stories most likely have sprung out of myth, some part of their legends have base in modern archaeological finds. The earliest evidence of human settlement in Italy comes from the Middle Bronze Age, around 1700 to 1300 BCE. And even though these findings are very scattered, it does point to an early human activity in the area. When excavations have been carried out in the old Roman city, the evidence does actually point to early settlement around 700 BCE, somewhat close to the founding myth state of 753 BCE. Through further digging and excavating, archaeologists have made discoveries that by the 6th century a more urban community with elite families had begun to spring up. Baltic and Greek artifacts have been found from this time period in the city, especially from graveyards where people have been found to be buried with them, signaling that an extended trade network existed in the peninsula. Signs of domesticated cats has also been discovered in the surrounding area. All of this evidence does of course not validate the legend of Romulus, but it does show that the later Roman historians were somewhat correct in their studies of Rome's early history. The dating from the city's founding to its gradual expanse and growth does somewhat mirror the findings from archaeological dig sites. We will never truly know exactly how Rome's early history looked like. All we have to go by are scattered findings, myths and sources which are written much later. But even if this is the case, as stated earlier, it is still important to examine what we have presented to us. The archaeological findings gives us a glimpse of the early settlement. 
The sources and myths of Romulus and his predecessor Aeneas shows us what the Romans themselves saw as important and grand in their history, and what they wanted to teach their future generations. These myths show us the Roman spirit just as much as their later conquest, and it is this spirit that flows through the city's history right up until its very end, centuries later. <laughs>